Good morning, church. Glad to be talking to you from a rainy crossful all the way over here and hope that you're dry and uh, still afloat way over there. We've been talking about politics, and politics, again, is just the discussion of how we should organize ourselves as communities, how we treat one another, how we live with one another, how we act neighborly toward one another. And we've noticed that Jesus is political. He's not political in the sense that he would be a Republican or he would be a Democrat or he would be an Independent. He's not political in the sense that he would necessarily vote or encourage us not to vote or that he would write his senator. But he's political in that he has very definite ideas and offers very definite practices about how we treat one another as neighbors. And in doing this, what we've discovered over the last few weeks is that he is political in ways that are radically different than the people around him. And the way that we've been talking about this is to contrast two stories. One, the story that frames the, at its heart, politics of the world. That is the, the story we've talked about, the story of fear and accusation and power. That we live in a scary world and things go wrong. And what we want to do, our temptation is to, um, and really more than a temptation, our practice has been to find who's to blame, uh, whether that's true or not and then get more power over them as a way of addressing the scariness of the world. We want to outshout or outvote or outbomb or outspend. We've been contrasting that story in a very basic way with the story that Jesus offers. Jesus comes into the world and he agrees that it's a scary and a broken place and there are things that need addressing, but rather than taking up the pow- uh, story of accusation and power, what he does is he takes up the story of the cross as an alternative politic. It's a different way of being neighbor, a different way of le- living in the world. And so what I want to do today is I want to um, begin to give shape to the story of the cross. We've talked about it in very broad terms, uh, but now today I want to uh, particularly look at four passages very briefly. We've talked about most of these before. These are all ones that you're going to be familiar with if you spend any time in church at all. But just to kind of lay them on the table, to kind of draw them together, to offer us a chance to reflect on these texts so that um, we can begin to wrestle with in this time where everyone is thinking about politics. Um, What does it mean to submit our political lives to Jesus? Of course we want to do that because we want to submit all of our lives, every part of them, to Jesus. And so we begin this morning with the notion of, I'm going to hit you with a theological term, Uh, we begin with the notion of kenosis. And kenosis comes from a Greek word that is used in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7 Uh, to describe Jesus emptying himself. If you pick up in uh, verse 6 of Philippians chapter 2, Paul says, I want you to have this mind in yourself. And we'll come back and we'll hit the context here in just a minute. He says, I want you to have this mind in yourself. He says, this is the mind Jesus had in himself. Uh, Jesus was, Paul will go on to say, and something that he's quoting from an ancient hymn here, that, that Jesus was equal with God. All of the power, all of the prestige, all of the privilege of being divinity. But Jesus did not think that that was something worth selfishly holding on to or exploiting. So what he did, it says in verse 7 of Philippians chapter 2, is he emptied himself. That's our term, kenosis, self-emptying, becoming empty. He emptied himself to take on the form of a human, not just a human, a servant. And then it says, very interestingly, that he was obedient by humbling himself. Listen to that term. Think about the notion of God humbling himself to the point of death, even the point of death on the cross. That That is, that in a story, in a world where we often take up the story, where we assume that to get things done, to accomplish whatever needs to be accomplished in the world, uh, to address the scariness and the brokenness, we often assume that what we need is more power. What we need is more votes, more money, a bigger budget, a bigger building, a bigger program, some stick or some tool to make those people over there who are, of course, the problem that needs fixing do what we want them to do or to otherwise stop them from doing whatever it is they're doing to break the world. We need more. And then you have Jesus in Philippians chapter 2 when Paul says this is the way he looks at things, this is the way I want you to look at things. Jesus who had all power, who had all privilege, who had all 
prestige, who was not lacking in any of those things that we think that we need more of. And Paul says that his solution, his way of addressing those things was rather than becoming fuller, getting more, was to actually give those things up. He emptied himself. He humbled himself. Instead of an upward motion to fix the problems of the world, Jesus offered a downward motion to fix the problems of the world. And this in Philippians chapter 2, just so we're clear, was an explicitly political situation. It wasn't one of geopolitical scope. It was a story of church politics. We're familiar with those two. Paul, writing to the Philippians, sees a church that has a lot of good things going on, but there are a couple of people or a couple of parties in the church at Philippi who are fighting about some things. They've got some sort of conflict, some sort of squabble, and that is an inherently political situation, right? How to be a neighbor, how to be a community, how to live with one another. And he says to them in Philippians chapter 2 that the way that you address this is not by out arguing the person against you, not by getting more votes so that you get your way over the person against you, not by outspending them or in some way getting enough power to subvert their cause so that you win. But he says in the verses leading up to this kenotic, this kenosis passage where Jesus empties himself, he says, that what we need to do, rather, is we need to learn to put other people first. We need to learn to humble ourselves and to set them ahead of us. As a matter of fact, that's the consistent witness of the New Testament. Um, in a world of fear and accusation and power, what we like to do is we like to draw camps of us and them, and the, the, the dynamic is always us against them we're the good guys, they're the bad guys, this is what's wrong in the world, we need to fix them by whatever means that we need to fix them with. Um, for Paul, it's not that there aren't parties of us in them, but his dynamic changes. It's us for them. And this is what we see in the self-emptying of Jesus. And so we want to talk about this politic of the cross. What does it mean to take up the politic of the cross in the world? And what we're going to find is at the very heart of it is there is still us in them, but it's not us against them, but it's us for them. And that the primary way of us engaging them for their blessing is not by filling ourselves up, but by emptying ourselves out. And so whenever we find ourselves in a situation where we need to address some sort of problem in the world, what we need to do, our first fundamental knee-jerk reflex needs to be um, not trying to fix them or silence them or outlaw them or keep them out or to force them out if they are already in or to stop them, but how might we lay our power down and serve them? And so that's kind of text number one. First move of the politic of the cross is kenosis. As a matter of fact, what we're going to see as we go through this is that um, without kenosis, the sort of love that we sing about and that we praise and that we cross-stitch and put on our walls that we see embodied in Jesus and commanded in the New Testament, that sort of love is impossible without kenosis. Because what kenosis does is it allows us to draw the boundaries between us and them in a wider and wider and wider fashion. Without self-emptying, there is no such thing as biblical love. A second passage that we want to add to that this morning is, uh, I'm just kind of working backwards here from Philippians to where we want to end up, is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 18, and we're going to go down through chapter 2, verse 5. And if you have some time this afternoon, I would encourage you to spend some time reflecting on that. For the sake of time this morning, I'm not going to read it verse by verse. It's the text we're familiar with. And so um, I'm just going to run through it. Uh, but the Corinthians, uh, much like the Philippians, they were a church that was all about the us versus them thing, particularly in chapter 1. And there are plenty of things that we could talk about here that the Corinthians were facing, but they had kind of divided up into parties of us and them, and they were fighting about who of those parties was better. And, you know, I was baptized by Paul. I was baptized by Apollos. I am of the party of Christ. You know, they've got the Jesus juke going on. And uh, so Paul is wanting to address that. And um, 
they kept trying to move up the ladder. You know, Paul, Apollos, Jesus, I'm better than you. I've got more prestige than you, more honor than you, more power <clears throat> than you. And so to take that up, Paul reminds them of certain fundamental realities of the cross. In verse 18, beginning in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he reminds them that when he came to preach, he preached to them nothing but Christ crucified, that he brought them the message of the cross. And this cross was um, foolishness according to the wisdom of the world. And it was weak or, or um, weakness according to the power of the world. And it was. I mean, the cross is what happens to losers. The cross is what happens to those who don't have enough power to get their way done. In the story of fear and accusation and power, the cross is what the Romans did to fix the world when they got in our way. So it was ridiculousness to suggest that someone who had been weak enough to lose to the Romans, to get crucified on a cross, was actually the one saving the world. But Paul reminds them of the fundamental reality of the cross, that the cross, even though it was foolishness to the world, was actually the wisdom of God being manifest. And the cross, even though it looked like weakness to the world, was actually the strength of God being manifest. And there's this fundamental truth that I don't want you to miss here, and this is um, something one of my preachers reminded us of earlier this week. I shared it on social media, but this has been a truth for a long time. It's not saying that the weakness of God is still stronger than the strength of men. But rather Paul is saying that God's strength is weakness. That the cross, this kenosis, this laying down his considerable power and dying was an expression of the strength of God. It's kind of like what uh, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians Chapter 12, when he has this thorn in the flesh and he goes to God and he prays three times, please remove this thorn of the flesh from me. And God says that we're not going to do that because in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. It is through weakness that God reveals his strength. His strength is the weakness. But we might look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, starting in verse 18, and we might say, well, that was fine and good for Jesus. Jesus had to die on the cross, and so we couldn't have had forgiveness of sins, but he just doesn't understand the way the world works. He doesn't understand that things are different for us. But Paul turns around to the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and he says to them, he says, now, I want you to also understand that this this weakness that is strength that God demonstrates in Jesus, this wisdom that is foolishness that God demonstrates in Jesus, this is also the same sort of thing that he is doing with you. He says, look at yourselves, sisters and brothers. Not many of you are strong, not many of you are wise, not many of you are esteemed by the world. God is working out that same strength that is weakness, that same foolishness that is wisdom in you that how God elects to work in Christ, which by the way was how God elected to work far before Christ, is now being worked out in you. And so Paul um, crescendos in this text at the beginning of chapter 2 leading up to the first five verses. He says, so remember when I came to you, I didn't come with fancy speech or persuasive arguments. I wasn't trying to impress you with how smart I was or my rhetoric or my grasp of philosophy. He said, what I did is I brought you nothing but Christ and Christ crucified. So again, we see this downward motion. And Paul says, this downward motion, this weakness, this weakness is the strength of God. And it seems to me that in a culture where we are enamored with being stronger, of being first in everything, of being the greatest, whether again or for the first time, which is not a purely Republicans concern. These are themes that run out or run throughout all the political parties over time that have been present in our nation. All of these impulses to get more, be first, these are going in precisely the opposite direction of what Jesus is going in. These are concerns that are diametrically opposed to what Jesus is concerned with. These are approaches to the rightful problems of the world that Jesus seems to be saying will never take us to where we want to go. In a world where we value strength and we value wisdom, it is um, true wisdom 
to practice the weakness that demonstrates God's strength, to practice and contemplate the foolishness that demonstrates God's wisdom. And this, Paul would say, is the politic of the cross. He's offering this to um, set up a political model. The third text is in John 13. This is, again, one that we're familiar with. This is Jesus at the Last Supper, and we're coming down to about verse 38. And this is where he says, I'm going to give you a new command. He says, the new command is this, that you love one another as I have loved you. And when you do this, then people will know that you belong to me. And we've talked about this one before, so I don't want to talk about it long. But, you know, we might rightfully ask, in what sense is this a new command? I mean, you've been going around now. This is the end of your life. You've been going around for at least three years in your ministry talking about love. We, we have quite a bit of love talk. You've told the story of the Good Samaritan and what it means to love your neighbor. You've given us the greatest commands. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. You've kind of elevated those. All you do is you talk about love. And so in what sense is this new? Well, I think in the context of John 13, they're in the upper room. This is the Last Supper. This is just before Jesus dies. Uh, this command is given in the same breath as Jesus talking just a few verses earlier about how the Son of Man, this is the term he uses, the Son of Man is going to be glorified. And uh, this phrase, the Son of Man is going to be glorified, picks up on a variety of Old Testament themes that his disciples would have immediately thought of because they were familiar with the Old Testament. Uh, but kind of the high water mark of those Old Testament themes is perhaps that vision in the book of Daniel. You remember Daniel has a dream and there is this, um, this series of increasingly scary monsters, four monsters that come and they battle one another. And these four monsters represent the nations of the world, the, the powers of his time and those coming in the future. But then halfway through the dream, this nightmare turns into a courtroom drama as the Ancient of Days sets up court and he puts those monsters on trial and he judges and he condemns and he dismisses those monsters, those who are in charge of the way that we normally do business. And then at the end of the dream, he glorifies, that is, he lifts up, he establishes the Son of Man. And the Son of Man is going to rule in ways that the monsters had failed to rule. The Son of Man is going to represent God in the way that the monsters had uh, failed to represent God. If the monsters represent the way things are, the Son of Man represents who is glorified, the way things should be. And so Jesus is in the upper room, and he says the Son of Man is about to be glorified. The way things are is passing away. The way things should be is coming, Jesus says. And in the way things should be, I'm going to give you a new command. This is kind of the heart of the way things should be. I want you to love one another like I have loved you. Now it's important here to note that this is sandwiched between two stories about Jesus. The first is when he, the king, God in flesh, all privilege, all power, all authority, all dignity, all of the prerogatives of the divine. Chapter 13 begins with him taking on the form of a servant and washing the feet of his disciples. And he says at the end of that, he says, you do what I have done. I've given you this example, so follow me. There's that kenosis, the king acting as a servant. And then right after that, at the end of um, his time in the upper room, before he goes out to the garden, before he's arrested, before he's crucified, you remember what he says? He says, greater love has no man than this, that they lay down their life for their friends. This love that Jesus exemplifies, this love that Jesus calls us to. And what I want you to see is this is placed in an explicitly political frame. Jesus is establishing a politic. The old is passing away. The monsters that represent the way things are done in the world are judged in Daniel's dreams. And the Ancient of Days glorifies the Son of Man to establish a new way of doing things. And that new way is the sort of love that lays its power down to wash the feet of those who, by the world standards, are under them. It's the sort of love that dies for others. The last text we want to talk about this morning is, um, let me flip over to it real quick, is in the book of Luke and in verse 22. This is, again, the Last Supper. This is, again, the upper room. This is, again, just before Jesus dies 
and is buried and uh, ultimately is resurrected. Here the disciples are fighting explicitly about who is the greatest. This is not unlike the beginning of John chapter 13. And Jesus um, hears them fighting about who is the greatest and what he does is he, he kind of hits them with an example. He says, um, if you're eating at the table, who is greater? The one who sits at the table, reclines at the table as they did things in that day and is served, or the one who is doing the serving? And everybody knows that the one who sits at the table, reclines at the table, the one who is served is the one who is the greatest. Um, but Jesus says, and remember, this is God, all of power, all of the prerogative, all of the authority, all of the dignity of divinity. He says, but I am among you as one who serves. I am not taking the position in our world of the one who, as he would say, lords over those under him by the world standards but serves them. And so we think about all of those other passages related to this one. Jesus saying the first must be last. The last must be first. The one who is the lead, least is the greatest. And so what does it mean to be political like Jesus is political? Step one, empty ourselves. Step one is kenosis. And this is the bedrock of love, the bedrock of the Christian ethic, the bedrock of the new order, putting ourselves first, or putting others first, emptying ourselves first. We've got to make sure we get that right. Um, I just want to leave you with that. I want you to ponder that this week. I want you to listen to the political talk going on around you and ask yourself how Jesus and this notion of kenosis reimagines the way we might treat one another as neighbors. But for now, um, we've done enough. We did four whole texts today. Uh, let's pray. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Then we'll remember who we are as we go out into God's world. Father, help us to empty ourselves. Help us to humble ourselves. We are in a position in history, in a position in the world where we have so much power. May we lay that down for the sake and the benefit of others. May we stop building walls. May we stop pushing people away. What May we stop saying us versus them. Will you deeply ingrain in us an ethic of us for them. Teach us to love like Jesus. And now we come and we pray as a family. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. We shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second commandment is like it. We shall love our neighbor as ourselves. And all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. We love because God first loved us. Anyone who says that they love God but hates their brother or sister is a liar. How are you going to love God, whom you have never seen, if you don't love your brother or sister who is right in front of you? So this is the command we have from him. Those who love God must also love their brother and sister. Church, have a great week. We love you. We miss you. Go love like Jesus. Our neighbors, our world, we desperately need it. Bye.